So welcome everyone for the first Rebel Wisdom Book Club. It feels like a very appropriate place to start as John Gebser has a huge influence on developmental thinking, people like Ken Wilber, and is very much the origin, the ever-present origin, some might say, of this kind of way of thinking. And we have uh, one of possibly the world expert on John Gebser with us, Jeremy Johnson. So Jeremy um, has written a book, Seeing Through the World, John Gebser and Integral Consciousness, and is also the president of the International John Gebser Society. Jeremy, welcome to Rebel Wisdom. Thank you, David. It's uh, great to be here. Um, really excited to be talking with you all today. Awesome. And so the format of this, the idea of the Rebel Wisdom Book Club came from Jules Evans, who many of you here will be familiar with. He's an amazing philosopher and writer and author who's been doing our philosophical journeys. And this is now going to be a monthly series led by Jules. We do know what the next book is going to be, so we'll have to remember to say that at the end, Jules, um, and who the next guest is going to be. And so in a second, I'm going to hand over to, to Jules to take it away. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. I'm going to, I'm going to look um, and, and stick around. And there will be an after hours hangout for this as well. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Jules Evans. Thank you, David. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, and uh, thanks for joining us. And thank you to Jeremy for giving us your time and expertise. Um, so the idea of the book club is just to explore some of the most important texts for the rebel wisdom, vision and community for uh, sense making uh, in the company of people who are experts in those books or who have been illuminated and changed and transformed by them. I'll say actually, I'll say what next month's book is now, David, I think, just in case we forget. So next month, for example, we're doing Alan Watts's um, The Book, uh, brackets, The Taboo Against Knowing Who You Are. And uh, the author, Tim Lott, is coming on to talk about why Alan Watts changed his life. Um, today, we're, we're very lucky to have uh, Jeremy giving us his time and wisdom. Um, and so, Jeremy, in terms of, you know, canonical books, um, if you just just before we get into the, the the nitty gritty, if you had to kind of sum up to uh, to someone who'd never really come across uh, Gebser, why he was worth reading, um, what would you how would you sum it up just as a kind of top level thing? Oh, good question. Uh, OK, so I, I would actually borrow this from William, William Irwin Thompson, who described uh, reading Ever Present Origin as a kind of book that changes your life. Um, I think that is the kind that is the response I often get from my students that that the book and reading and going through the book as as we are doing right now in my in my course is a transformational experience that it's a catalytic kind of read and it really gets under your skin it really challenges you to begin to observe your own forms of sense making uh, how you pay attention to temporics how your relationality between yourself and the world is going on and changing and what the different dimensionalities of those are so it's just it's just one of those books that works on you <laughs> so i would invite folks who haven't read it uh, to do so because even if you don't quite get where he's going conceptually, it's working on you. And then I would say like McLuhan, Marshall McLuhan is another one of those thinkers and writers who has that kind of efficacy um, in the text. So very powerful kind of reading, um, maybe similar to, to some, some Jungian texts too. Like I think Jung is another one of those uh, writers, selectively, some books uh, that can be like that. So, mm -hmm. so perhaps um, could you start off by giving us a, a very brief summary of his life? Oh, yeah. Uh, he was an interesting, I mean, he's kind of like, he was in these different circles that some folks may be familiar with through other thinkers, like I mentioned Jung. And uh, you know, for, for a good portion of his life, he was in Switzerland and attending the Iranos lectures, where folks like D.T. Suzuki and Carl Jung, um, later James Hillman, Iliadi, these folks were mingling and discussing and having lectures, and he was amongst those circles. But he was also in, uh, in France for a time as well, um, hanging out with the French existentialists and uh, members of the 
eventual members of the resistance. Um, and then before then, in his younger years, he was actually hanging out with the Bohemian uh, poets in, in Spain for a time. And his whole life is as a kind of series of a uh, wanderlust or also refugee in terms of the kind of instability of, of Europe during uh, the 20th century. He, he escaped uh, his, uh, he escaped Spain uh, barely with his life. He was nearly executed at the border and he left his apartment two hours before it was bombed. And then the same thing happened uh, where he got into Switzerland two hours before the the borders closed. So so his life is these kind of near brushes with death um, and really interesting relationships with very interesting thinkers, scientists, poets, artists, including uh, Picasso is another one that he knew, I think, in France. Mm -hmm. So very interesting and, and not very well known, right? We know the pe people he knew. So... And he wasn't um, an institutional person. He wasn't an academic. What, how did he make his living? I, for the most part, doing translation and editorial work. Uh, so he, he published a number of volumes of uh, translations of Spanish poets. He was working, I believe, with the Ministry of Education in Spain for a bit. Um, not quite sure what he was doing in France, but something probably similar. And even though he wasn't classically trained in academia, he was always sort of adjacent to it because his first work, for instance, Rilke in Spain was a study of Rilke, study of the poet Rilke and, and, and the changes in, uh, not to go into too many particulars, but the changes in relationship to language and grammar, grammar in German poetry and how it was exhibiting a new style or attitude or relationship with time. So he was really interested in kind of the modernist movements and commenting on them and then participating as a poet himself. You might even call him a, a, like an independent poet scholar, as it were. And, and like other Renaissance thinkers, like maybe Wilbur or Huxley, he seemed to have been comfortable in the world of the arts and the sciences. Yes, yes. Uh, I, would, I would say particularly that his relationship with scientists was well-developed. Um, and that he would be mingling with them as well as the artists and see the through lines and the connections that they were drawing. Mm. So I, I want to ask you about, I, I think I'm right in thinking he had a kind of formative mystical experience. But before that, I mean, obviously he's so fascinating because one of the reasons is he uses the word integral so early. Um, were there you know, were there influences on him before we get to the ever-present origin? What would be the kind of key influences on him? Was he reading people like Sri Aurobindo or where was, were there, where were the rivers coming into his thinking? You know, what's interesting with that is uh, he discovered Aurobindo's work only after having written the first edition or first part of ever-present origin. And then in the, in the second preface or forward, he goes out of his way to acknowledge Aurobindo and say, in other writings too, say, you know, perhaps everything that I've been doing has been a kind of emanation from this great spiritual teacher. So he's because very he, humble he about it. He used the phrase integral as well, didn't he? In about he did. In 1920. Yes. Yeah. Well, he, he did. And uh, I don't know if Gebser directly came in contact with that at all. And in fact, some of his first language for this was, he called it a perspectivity. And we can go into the ins and the outs of that in relation to the, his model, but but he described it first as the a perspectival world. And then in the 1940s, he started to use this terminology of integral and wow. start to use it in that terminology. It's very specific and, and again, we'll go into it, but uh, yeah, Aurobindo was not so much a foundational influence for him as much as, much as really the uh, the poetry of Rilke, really the study and poetry of Rilke, both personal, spiritual. He even goes to Spain in some in some sense to trace the footsteps of Rilke's own poetic journeys and creative journeys. Um, and it's in Spain in 1931, 1932, he describes a lightning-like flash of inspiration, right? Where the, the whole sort of in a flash appears to him. And he, he takes the next 20 years to really unpack what that experience was and then what the what the kind of influences were just in terms of um for instance he was good friends with the poet Lorca um and it was really Lorca and the being in Spain and being in such an ancient place that him both as a scholar and then also I think as a very sensitive poet and maybe even having this disposition towards mysticism uh or spiritual experience that he had these sort of revelations 
poetically speaking, right. uh, about the presence of the past and the presence of this vaster history of consciousness. And it was really, again, through Lorca's poetry and also Rilke's um, innovations that he was, he was sort of, that was his through line, that was his foundation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So getting into his, what, uh, before we get into his ideas, actually, I wanted to ask about his politics, because obviously he was growing up, um, what was it kind of, he was around for the First World War and the Second World War, um, fascism, uh, you know, Stalinism sweeping across Europe. What were his politics? You know, Ge Gebser's understanding, I mean, first of all, he was friends with the poets. He was friends with the artists who were often being persecuted to some capacity and fleeing Germany, right? So mm -hmm. um, he even Imagine. changed his name uh, from Hans to Jean or Jean mm -hmm. uh, after after leaving Germany during the rise of, of, of the fascist government. So yes, I, I think his, his politics were definitely, um, I, I don't really know if progressive is an appropriate term, but some of that does filter into his writing later on, but he talks about it more in the context of superseding the left and the right, right? And the, the, the diagnosis that he presents in a lot of his work about mass movements and totalitarianism have to do with his understanding of the structures of consciousness and how they can go awry, right? Oscillating okay. between atomization and collectivism in this sort of uh, um, unhinged uh, oscillation, which he described as sort of the collapse of the mental perspectival world, which he saw happening. So in the context, his politics are, are, are linked to how he understands what's going on in consciousness. Mm -hmm. So um, he, after the war, he's in Switzerland and he writes his magnum opus, um, uh, The Ever-Present Origin. Um, and that lays out a theory of a kind of structures of consciousness which reading it in the excerpts you, you sent out to us very much strikes me as, as, as reminiscent of Ken Wilber. Um, could we start there, perhaps ex explaining what the different structures are? Yeah, so, so folks may be familiar with the terminology Wilbur uses, archaic, magic, mythic, mental, integral. Um, Wilbur uses it slightly different. I think he switches out mental with rational which, which I have some pushback against. I think it, you know, it, when we use Gebser's terminology, we should use it because he had very specific reasons for it. But yeah, so what essentially started for him is an interest in the innovations of modernist art, language, poetry, and science that was going on in Europe and sort of sweeping Europe in the 20th century, um, moved into a deeper, more, more, historical study of the history of consciousness, kind of like Eric von Neumann's work, right? Origins and history of consciousness. Um, so ever present origin uh, really kind of opened up, well, okay, if there are innovations in our relationship to time and space, subject and object that are happening right now, perhaps these transformations have happened before, right? And even again, as I was mentioning, his, his friendship with Lorca really made those earlier transformations, those earlier mutations palpable and concrete in Lorca's poetry. Um, and it kind of goes into it as a sort of, um, he describes Lorca and his poetry as sort of invoking the realm of the of the mothers, right? The, the the divine feminine and the presence of the ancestors and the dead. So he goes into that, and really the structures of consciousness as we move through, in Gebser's terminology, each structure is a unique center of gravity uh, relationship with time and space. So in the magic or, or the archaic, there's a kind of latency. Right, all of the structures are co-present with each other, and they unfold in these series of discontinuous leaps or mutations. And really, what you see in terms of the overall shape of these mutations is an increasing dimensionality, an increasing remoteness from origin in terms of our own perception, and an increasing sense of distanciation and, and selfhood. Right. And this is probably if folks who are familiar with like Charles Taylor's work, they may be familiar with his description of the buffering of the self. Gebser's describing a very similar process happening through these structures. What's interesting about his work is that he's very critical not to say this is strictly developmental in the sense that you master the magic and then you move on to the mythic and you build on the mythic and you move to the mental. Rather, these are, yes, there's some development, right? But 
more so these structures each have their kind of unique excellent and brilliance in the world, right? A unique form of mastery that may or may not be sequential or developmental for the next one. And I'll give you an example. Um, he talks quite a bit about and gives a lot of um, credence to the magic and mythic capacity, the magical capacity of being, the way he uses it is one point is all points, right? Magic is very resonant and acoustic and auditory. There's a resonance with the self in the world. There's a permeability of becoming, let's say, you know, becoming the animal, like becoming animal as Deleuze uh, has, has popularized that description. Um, in the mythical, there's more of this emphasis on image and psyche, right? And he's going, those are valid realities, right? The twilight world of the magic and the mythic, the overall, what he says, the unperspectival world has its own way of sense making, relating to the world, understanding time, engaging in time. And then the mental waking consciousness of, of secularity, spatiality, um, you know, individualization that we as in the West have really emphasized. That's also a valid one. They don't necessarily build up on each other like we're growing up from childhood because in many ways we sever our relationship with these earlier structures. They remain in us, but they remain in us in a very unhealthy, unintegrated kind of way. They go back into latency, but that latency is pathological, right? And that goes back to what I was commenting on earlier about some of his critiques and analysis of the 20th century, that this overemphasis on this mental structure of thinking, sense-directed thinking, is really responsible for the hyperfragmentation of the world, and that really we needed something orthogonal to that rather than more progress, right? Or a flight back, right? Because there's no going back necessarily in that same kind of way. Um, just to give you like a general picture of it. Yeah. So, I mean, it reminds me a bit of other kind of theories of the historical development of consciousness or the evolution of consciousness at that time, like Owen Barfield or there's someone called Gerald Hurd. Um, it was his theory historical. Does he believe that these are different historical phases in human existence? And did he try to say this was in, say, you know, the Stone Age and this was in the medieval age or, or am I misunderstanding? No, he did. Um so he has a, a rather cryptic relationship between the historical. And then he also says each of these structures are latent in origin in, in that they are adjacent to history. Or he says, um, describing it in this way um, as poetry and poetry is the history of the dateless. So there's a sense that like they, they are pre and post historical. There's something that are innate to origin and innate to presence, innate to humanity, but that historically speaking, they've had their time to be explicitly predominant, right? To take shape in, uh, through culture, through cultural phenomenology. So they have an interesting intersection. Yes and no, right? Um, yeah. And so are we in the mental stage at the moment? Uh, uh, and, and can you explain how that relates to the emergence of kind of perspective and spatial measurement? It's uh, fascinating just hearing you talk about him on, on uh, you know, on, on the Internet about the, the development of kind of uh, spatial and temporal perspective, say, around the kind of Renaissance. Yeah, so that that was um you know, some of my favorite parts of the ever-present origin when he's describing really early on, I think it's like chapter two, uh, the, the, he calls it the three European worlds. And again, the con the context of this for Gebser, he was studying what he calls the Occident and European cultures. Like it was an approach through, through Western literature, right? Um, so there's a somewhat of a limit there, but he's also acknowledging that, like, here's what I'm really looking at. So uh, just to give you that context, but he says, you know, we move through um, briefly the unperspectival into the perspectival, right? The twilight um, image centric, mythical and magical centric world uh, towards the sort of awakening of consciousness. And he really paints this very interesting history, quite literally bringing in, uh, you know, Renaissance painters, uh, the development of like manifestos on perspective um, that you can see the kind of minor adjustments and tweaks to the development of trying to represent space in a two dimensional image and how the artists as individuals seem to be possessed by space or possessed 
by this urge to master spatiality, right? Um, and he talks a lot about the visual pyramid, right, is, is sort of analogous to our sort of perspectival thinking of the eye that it make, is making observations. But he's, you know, there's an ambiguity in that, right? Because whenever we make a, a, an observation from that perspective, we cut ourselves off from the whole, right? So as he says, the totality, if you look at the etymology of the word totality, it means all, but ambiguously, it also means death. So there's a sense of stasis that's latent in perspectival thinking he's very interested in. And making the cut and sectorization is also this, again, it's a strength. It helps us measure and categorize and expand and master space, but also the downside is atomization, alienation, colonization, right? Um, and he's, he talks about it as a kind of um, like a runaway force or intensity, right? That, that we seem to be possessed by it, but we cannot really slow down at this point. Like we were kind of on this runaway mechanistic train as it were. Um, so yes, but, but the, the spatial renaissance is a really interesting area to cover and to study because you can see it in individuals as they really wrestle with um, learning how to stand apart from the world and really orienting themselves towards the eye and visual perception to measure and master space. So you have Giotto introducing geometric perspective into paintings and depth. Around the same time, you have Galileo saying, you know, space, physical space is what we can measure. And the mental, well, we can't really measure it. So let's just ignore that for the time being. Then you get like kind of Newtonian geometry and physics. So this is this all part of the same kind of new stage in consciousness that he saw emerging that we're in now? Yeah, yeah, he, he really saw the beginning of this. I mean, the mental structure didn't start in the Renaissance. Um, he really traces it back to quite, you know, the early, the Greeks and so on. But um, again, like if we see it in a, in a bit more of a permeable way, we can say, okay, the mental structure um, really kind of came into being um, sometime in, in agrarian societies. And then the perspectival, the specific perspectival world he's talking about, where space becomes now predominant over myth, over magic, et cetera, is really this Renaissance period, right? The birth of modernity, the runaway capacity of, of the spatial thinking. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I forgot if, if that was your question, but. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is a good time to, to explain to us his idea of origin. And, and are we in some ways in, in the mental state of mind that we're in now, somehow separated from origin? And, and what did he mean by origin? Yeah, so, so the second question, right, uh, about are we separated? I would say that, that the mental structure has become so overridingly predominant that our perception, our capacity to feel like we are participating in origin is, is veiled or occluded, right? There's a lot of psycho-spiritual work that needs to happen. Like, but ultimately what he's saying is this integral shift is this sort of sudden surging, flashing forth of the whole. So as we're always participating in it. And it's a spiritual observation. When Gebser's talking about origin, he also uses language like the spiritual. Um, or the itself. And he goes to uh, what I often say, and he mentions this throughout EPO and his later writings too, he goes to contemplatives to really find the language for it. Like he goes to Meister Eckhart, he goes to DT Suzuki, who he also was friends with and, and corresponded with uh, later in his life, to try to describe what it means to be present with origin in the present. And in the document that we shared, um, you know, that's the, the, that first bit, right? Um, origin is ever present. That, that's the first paragraph of the first preface in ever present origin. Really that paragraph contains everything. Um, and he's saying like the, the present and origin are not just a now. There's a sort of openness to presence, which somehow involves us, which is open to time. And that's really the key insight that he's going to in terms of talking about origin. There's an intensity of consciousness that opens us up to the world that we participate in from moment to moment. And then also that is, there is a wholeness to it, right? There is a living interrelationship of subject and object, self and world, and then also past, present and future in that kind of radiancy of the moment. 
and he did have an interesting experience uh, later in his life at at, at Sarnath. Um, he he was going through. Uh, really traveling through Asia, exploring, kind of balancing out his work. As he said, you know, he was studying mostly European history and, and, and culture in, in his early in his life and then moving now into an interest in, in Asian studies. And um, it was at Sarnath where he had this like wonderful, wonderfully beautiful experience of, of what he feels like origin kind of really kind of recasting him. He describes like, ever since then I am as if recast. He describes it as a kind of ever-present clear and sober light, right? Which just left him open to the world and it never went away. And in his correspondence with Dichi Suzuki, Suzuki's like, yeah, this isn't Kensho. Um, this isn't Samadhi. This is a Satori. Um, so interestingly enough, um, uh, Jirat Feuerstein, one of uh, Gebser's friends and a yoga scholar, um, he wrote this to him and then told him to burn the letter. Like, don't, I don't want anybody to think I'm a guru. Um, and Feuerstein, as a loving friend who knew in posterity that this would be read in a different context, saved it. Um, and so there's an interesting little bit you can find online um, of him describing this, this experience. Sarnath was where the Buddha first preached. Is that right? In right, India? right. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I want to get a bit deeper into his interesting ideas on time. But before then, just in case people are, are still wondering, so his idea of origin, is it similar to what someone might call God? Why didn't he use a term like God? And, and what was his, how did he situate himself in terms of religion or spirituality? Great question and a loaded one. There's so much to unpack, but I'll be brief. Uh, he avoids the usage of the term God or Godhead or um, explicitly, let's say, Christian language um, or divine spark, right? He's very careful, and you will see this in, in the reading. He's almost frustratingly careful with the language he chooses to use. And maybe this is because he was both an intellectual and a poet that he's always like, what is the appropriate statement? Like, what is the new statement? What kind of language appropriately expresses integral consciousness? Can we go on to use the same language or does our language need to transform as well? So he was very careful to avoid God for the theological associations. He was careful to avoid any kind of imagistic orientation. Not there's anything wrong with it. He just felt divine spark is a very mythical expression of this. Like, so his question is almost like a question left standing, which is what is the integral expression of that, right? That which we cannot really name the ineffable. Um, so again, which, which it could be frustrating, but also kind of interesting because he ends up sounding a little like Meister Eckhart, ironically, trying to talk about it. <laughs> and you said he, he consulted with contemplatives. So it doesn't sound like he was a Christian or going to church, but what was his relation to the religions or spiritualities around him? I, you know, um, like, like I think a lot of folks in the early 20th century, his relationship with Christianity was mostly cultural, uh, like the language, the image making around Christ, etc. It was certainly present. Um, and I would say even he uses it here and there to illustrate what he's talking about. Um, there's there's a, like a beautiful passage about, speaking of Easter, uh, which just passed, um, where he's talking about giving an illustration of the papacy um, uh, acknowledging the, the assumption of Mary in body into heaven. And he says, you know, this is a great move because it's integrating the divine feminine, right? Which um, has been so far like, uh, we've all predominantly emphasized the masculine and the patriarch, right? So bringing in the feminine is great. But then he also says, and emphasizing a new life, a new spiritual life, a diaphanous spiritual life where the body is rendered transparent to the spirit is, a, you know, would be an integral Christianity. So he uses Christianity, I think, by kind of turning it, dialing it into, <laughs> into his integral themes and principles. Um, and then one more thing too, maybe like a little illustration of how he would be thinking about the structures of consciousness and let's say religion. Um, he talks about how the earlier structures have a kind of, um, he talks about the language itself, religion, religio, right? It means to bind back, but 
earlier interpretations or understanding understandings of that word is to observe the mysteries, right? To, to regard the mysteries, to regard and to become in some sense present to something, a mystery. Um, then it becomes a kind of binding back, right? Uh, which, which he says is still kind of, is sort of like a mental orientation. We're no longer participating in and observing in, we're now binding back. And he says, what we really need to do with, uh, an, uh, a spirituality of, of, of the integral consciousness, as he says, not an obligation to bind back, but an, but an obligation to the present. And he describes it as moving from religio to religion to pray legio. Pray, I guess, meaning kind of superseding this arc, right? And really kind of presentiating in a transparent sphere, the spiritual and the human. Um, and so, yeah, he has some quite profound comments on, on, uh, and religion and theology that I would love to see somebody better suited for that unpack. Mm -hmm. So you've mentioned the term transparency, which was clearly important to him. And I'd like to go on to that. But before that, let's look at his idea of time and these interesting phrases like the eruption of time. I, I guess when I think of some integral type thinkers uh, like Aldous Huxley, Huxley wanted to escape time into the kind of timeless moment or Eckhart Tolle, you know, to really escape the past and the future in the here and now. But it seems like Gebser wasn't about just trying to be totally in the moment, that he had a different kind of perspective on time. Yes, yes. Um, in, in that first paragraph in the document we shared, he's saying, you know, mm -hmm. the present is not just the mere now, that there is a there is a mode of perception that we can practice and like a contemplative work with that opens up the present. And it's much more than that. And it, we don't need to escape time, that there is an intensity of becoming present where we become, as he says, free for time and free from time. And that's his, another word he drops that like confuses folks all the time. And I understand because he has so much terminology he's using, um, but he's, he calls it the achronon or time freedom. And then juxtapose that, he says, this is the real nature of time. Time is this intense, bountiful present, which seems to be able to, um, as he's saying, time, origin, time, freedom, they're all kind of linked with each other. That the intensity of presence and the present and the presence of origin in the present um, is sort of, it's almost like identifying with, uh, as like Blake calls, you know, um, eternity is in love with the productions of time. It's identifying with that creative principle, that creative presence that brings things forth. And so for Gebser, uh, the present, that's that's where freedom lies. And that's also, that's where participation and embodiment and incarnation lie. You know, the human being transparent to the eternal, but also in the world, right? Um, so he, for him immediately on page one, he's like, all right, we're not going to make this a dichotomy. You know, it's not going to be an escape. Um, and it's also not going to be a, a push forward either, right? It's not an escape from time, and it's not the sort of linear sense of the chronological and uh, the material and historical. The time is so much more. My final point might be, well, we, we can unpack it and continue to unpack what he means by time eruption, but um, part of this is, is the sense that uh, just as we were possessed by space in the Renaissance, what he saw happening in the in the 19th and 20th centuries was uh, we were beginning to be possessed by time and doing so through the modalities and sense making of the perspectival world. So just as the Renaissance painters were giving us these beautiful mythical images of the divine and their cosmology, we are attempting to squeeze time, um, the, the dimensionality of time and integral consciousness into the spatial mental perspectival world, right? And he says that that kind of tension is also responsible for why time keeps pressing forward, right? The intensity of time keeps pressing forward as an anxiety, um, whether we're talking about the rapid innovations of the early 20th century, the world wars, uh, uh, the attempt to master time through the mechanical and spatial and categorical only intensifies the crisis. And as he says, it bursts the spatial world into fragmentation, into atomization. And ultimately he says, you know, that's, that's a dead end, right? Um, so there's this both the sense of time run away from us. And then also this sense that um, uh, 
ironically of like not really being able to produce the new anymore. Like a lot of contemporary thinkers talk about that, like Mark Fisher and Bifo Berardi, um, especially on the left, there's this discourse about, you know, where is this, where is the energy and vitality to produce the new, right? And I think Gepser mm -hmm. would be very interested in that being talked about today. Mm, I can't remember who it was who said, the old has passed away, but the new has yet to be born. So in terms of the birth of the new, and by the way, I should say to everyone watching as well, you're going to get chances to ask your questions too. So if any of this doesn't seem clear to you or you'd like to go deeper into it, uh, write it down. And uh, in about kind of 10 minutes or so, I'm going to open it up to all of you. Um, so um, he, in terms of the, the, the emergence of the new, he talks about this, what would it be the kind of final stage or the next stage of, of integral consciousness? Um, uh, could you tell us about that? What, did he see it as happening when he was writing, like in, in, in the 20th century? What were its characteristics? How, you know, how, how do we notice it? And perhaps explore a bit that word of transparency, which seems to be connected to it. Yeah, yes and yes. Um, yes, it was happening in his time. Uh, really, if, if you're reading uh, Ever Present Origin, um, in the second part of the book, part two, Manifestations of the Aperspectival World, it's a kind of an interesting historical document because he traces for in the first chapters the history of this eruption of time. And then he also documents as, as comprehensively as he can across many different chapters, art, mathematics, science, uh, biology, psychology, looking for, trying to, to um, whittle down perhaps certain themes like transparency, like um, he describes superseding subject object dualism. And so he would see some through lines, like there's a section on architecture that I've been revisiting recently. Um, uh, on the Bauhaus and Frank Lloyd Wright and talking about, look at these innovations in the interior and the exterior, the inner and the outer, even in our structures are beginning to become more transparent, that the inside and the outside now have formed a continuum. That is a, is a structure in architecture. But then he's also saying, you know, certain quantum physicists, physicists are talking about, you know, the subject object really kind of collapsing somehow. Um, so he's really interested in that. And he's also very interested in what he says, um, different disciplines that are become, becoming or trying to accommodate time and process rather than state, like a static categorical model, a processual open-ended model, right? That allows for emergence. Um, and the, he was writing this, I think really, I don't know if he was familiar much with cybernetics back in the day, but really that he was, he was along the same lines of like what Gregory Bateson would be talking about very soon and what a lot of the complexity thinkers would be describing. Um, so the incorporation of temporics, and he would say this too, right? A lot of these themes, this quality of transparency, relationship between the inner and outer kind of opening up is one of the big themes. Um, this also helps us understand what he means by time, right? That the time and the present can become translucent, that the history of consciousness was surging forward desiring to be integrated. And that time itself was pressing upon our civilization, desiring to be integrated. Like it's almost as if the veils have already been lifted um, in that sense. And we're dealing with this aftermath of everything kind of pressing upon us in this, in this great intensity that was the 20th century. And of course is our time now. Um, but the examples he illustrates are very, very bountiful in, in the latter part of the book. Is this something that's just going to naturally happen, or does it uh, create any imperatives for us as individuals or a, as a society? Yeah, great question too. Um, Gepster does talk about courage. Um, you know, the courage to uh, to integrate what has been opened up. Uh, and he says the courage to live mythically and magically and mentally, right? To, to render the whole transparent, to live transparently is something we can choose, it is a volition. But the other hand, he's like, let's not get too perspectival and anthropocentric about it. Because, you know, even in the Renaissance, they were possessed by this shift in consciousness, the desire for something that was pressing forward in consciousness to be realized by that particular culture through its cultural phenomenology, its art, its science. We are also being moved by the itself, as he says, or, or origin. So there is this, 
way in which it is both us and then it's also bigger than us, right? It's volitional and then also it's going to be realized one way or another. And even it says very, in a very kind of stark way throughout the book, but um, towards the beginning of EPO, especially, you know, either we will fulfill time, meaning we will creatively master and realize what's pressing forward in our consciousness, or it will fulfill us, meaning the end of the human experiment in that sense. So, so there's this intensity that he's saying like, yeah, yeah. Okay. But don't get too, too caught up in, you know, our heroic realization here, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, could you, he died in early 70s, am I right? Right, and, yeah, uh, 73. And when, was he always influential? When did he start to be influential? Uh, I guess Wilbur was starting to write in the kind of 60s or 70s. Um, what, 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 tell us the story of, of, of the influence of his, his ideas um, after, after he wrote them. You know, it, it, was, it's, it was kind of unfortunate because right around the time his health was starting to fail. He, uh, he was getting noticed uh, in, the, in the 1970s. A lot of young, I mean, it was the consciousness movement, you know, the hippies had just happened. Um, a lot of the updates in his book were kind of, you know, ha doing a little hat tip to the, the new generation or the young generation, which is ready for these insights, et cetera. Um, he received a chair, um, a, a, uh, what, he was awarded a chair of a comparative civilizations, I think, in Switzerland. Um, so, and he couldn't take it because his health was too too frail. Um, so it was really right at the end of his life that, um, and he died somewhat young. I think he was in he was in his seventies, um, early seventies. So uh, it, it was really unfortunate that he kind of just was getting the notoriety and attention that I feel like he you know deserved through a lot of his life. Um, but in the 1980s, yes. Uh, so I would say there's been a, there are a few currents of influence. It was George Feuerstein, who was his friend. Um, there was in the in the in the 60s uh, a series of conferences that he put together, bringing economists, artists, poets to kind of talk about you know uh, uh, everything going on. And then in the 1970s and 80s, uh, I would say the Lindisfarne Association through William Aaron Thompson is a really good kind of in the spirit of what Gepser was doing. And then William Aaron Thompson himself was really influenced by, by, by Gepser's work through the 1980s. Um, because I think the work started to get translated and we had the 1985 translation of EPO by, uh, by Algus McCunis and Noel Barstead. So really it was the eighties where it kind of broke out and Wilbur got a copy of, of a piece of it. So Wilbur started to adapt it into his work. Um, and then, and then we can move on from there. But, but yeah, I mean, he, Gepser still, I, I would say Gepser's still on the up and up. <laughs> like he's, he's always been a subtext, uh, with a lot of mm -hmm. other thinkers, but I think he's really kind of coming to the forefront a bit more, uh, as of late. And of course, you're an important part of that, and you're very much bringing a new generation's attention to him. Why do you think he is uh, particularly relevant to us now in, an, in, in the Anthropocene, in an era of when institutions are breaking down, there's ecological crisis? What he, what can, how can he help us in this time? Oh, yeah, that's great. Um, on the one hand, I think uh, why he's gaining traction now is is in the in the integral community and pr probably in the extended sense making community uh he offers a form of integral phenomenology that is again uh, again very aesthetic oriented poetic oriented experiential but he's not afraid of the theory the theory is there right um and then also his model itself is is much more resonant with uh the messiness of consciousness in terms of his own model. It's discontinuous um, in terms of these discontinuous uh, nonlinear leaps, right? So his, his thinking is, is unfinished in that sense. You know, part of the, the I mean, the latter half of the book is really um, cutting away mental perspectival assumptions, language, thinking to kind of leave us at this sort of very bare bones state of, well, how do we express the new? And who's really doing it? How do we incorporate time and temporics in a non-spatial categorical way in our art, language, et cetera? That's an unfinished task. You know, I, I think we're still experimenting with that. And the themes he was talking about in terms of the eruption of time, the intensity of time, 
we're dealing like we're dealing with that more than ever before, just in terms of the Anthropocene and the climate crisis. I mean, talk about time eruption. Gebser would have so much to say about the state of anxiety we all kind of live in right now with this looming, um, ever-present climate disaster, right? The sense of collapse that we're all living in. So in, in many ways, he, he's he's become appropriate to Gebser because he talked about the sense of the future in the present. He's becoming more appropriate to our moment. Our moment is becoming more along the lines of what he was describing back in 1949, which is mind blowing on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, you know, if, if we don't see time as, as explicitly linear or strictly developmental, then yeah, maybe we, we kind of, in particular historical moments near the future and near a thinking of the future, and that might recede. Right, so the plasticity of time is also one of the one of the things that I think we really glean from from Gebser as well. Mm. And what what do you think are the flaws in his vision or the limitations? Um, what do people say, or what do you personally think? I mean, I, I just to me sometimes one of the the limits of integral thinking can be that it's like a more of a theory than a practice that that. It, it, it kind of tries to integrate perspectives but can end up like, uh, I don't know, undermining traditional forms of belonging, you know, so it doesn't give us a form of community. Um, but what do you think, uh, Jeremy? What, what might be some of the limitations or, or criticisms one could make? You know, I think, I think that criticism is appropriate for what the integral community has sort of become. Um, maybe not for Gebser, because I think he spends, you could read Gebser and, and kind of weave an argument for tradition, uh, because so much of what he talks about is really double-edged about the mental structure. Like, yes, there's so many innovations, but then, you know, the double side of the blade is also the severing of rootedness, of locality, of tradition, of, of um, place thinking like a, you know, Tyson Young Caporta talks about indigenous thinking is so place-based. Gebser talks about that dissociation and abstraction, right? Um, but I would say as, as a thinker himself, uh, I, I know he could be frustratingly dense as a writer. I mean, he's very much in that kind of style of um, dense philosophical thought. I think he's very poetic, but I think he can be a little frustrating in that he's not offering... Um, uh, short summaries. He's not taking any shortcuts. He's not offering particular practices. He didn't see himself as a, as a guru or a spiritual teacher. Uh, so when people read Ever Present Origin, they might go, well, what do I do? This has changed my life. Like I, I want to live integrally. I want to, like, it seems like he's talking about um, this, like he describes it as strictly wakeful being in the present. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that, right? So I think that's the that's the question he leaves open, frustratingly so. Uh, but I wouldn't call him abstract. Uh, I would say, uh, despite all of that, he he's very viscerally there with you in the in the in the writing. Um, but again, you know, I, I think uh, because of the cutting away of like, okay, it's not this, it's not that. Um, he leaves a little bit for us to begin to work with, but there's no there's no easy path. Right. Um, so I don't know if that's much of a criticism. I, I mean, I'm biased. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and just finally, and before I, we, we're going to take some questions, and I, I'll ask um, maybe Ella to start off by picking a couple from from the chat. Um, how has he uh, changed you, and 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 what impact has he had on you? His ideas had on you, kind of personally. Would you say? You know, um, there's many ways to to answer that, but I think um, the, the obviously reading Gapster, I couldn't go back to reading Wilbur the same way um, and, and developmental approaches to, to integral thinking. Um, it, it really kind of spoiled that for me. Um, I, I think actually the first time I read Gapster, I, I closed the first page of the book and I, there was this palpable sense like he's doing something different with time that I've never read before and like what Wilbur is doing. Like, what is it? And I was in my early 20s about it. So in some sense, he's kind of, he's kicked me off the edge and I've been trying to find my way since then. Um, but yeah, no, I think for me, the, the sense of um, 
the present and time and reading Gepser and teaching Gepser and writing the book, um, bringing that into my attention has felt very transformative. Um, I, I will not say I've, I've reached anything near what Gepser seems to have just spontaneously uh, approached in his own life, but that sense of um, openness to things um, and, and the overcoming of uh, of of, of uh, feeling like a distantiated ego. Like I've I've been lucky to have a few moments where where that isolation has sort of thawed out, and um, I'm very grateful for that. Hmm. Well, I think it's a great service to to kind of keep a good idea and a good thinker alive. Um, so thank you so much, Jeremy. And now we'll, we'll, we'll take some questions if that if that works with you. And um, Ella, should we start off by maybe, do you want to read out um, like say three questions and Jeremy, if you, can, if you want to take a note of them and just what we'll, we'll do it in three and then maybe we'll take some live ones. Um, so Ella, I'll hand over to you. Sure. So the first question that I think we're gonna start with is from Kate Graves. And she starts with a, a quote, poetry as the history of the dateless. Um, and then there's quite a long, if Kate's happy to read it, would you be okay with her unmuting and doing it that way? And then it comes through her voice and with her sense behind it. Is that okay, Jules? The format? Oh, yeah, sure. If it's not too long, let's try and keep it brief to get lots of questions in. Okay, Kate. Hi, thank you. Um, I guess my question is around poetics. Um, I'm looking at Gebser as he's looking at these structures of perspectives. And I'm interested that he was a poet and a poetry really unstructures language, like it destructures syntax. So I don't know, I just, I'm finding that interesting. And I'm wondering, it sounds like a lot of his theory or his life was inspired by poetry and poets and his sense of the poetic. And I'm just wondering if there's intersection or dialogue around him right now with people studying or talking about contemporary poetry and how it might uh, relate or like further this kind of collapse of the subject object relation or timelessness that we're kind of seeking. Great question, Kate. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I can't really answer in terms of contemporary poets. Uh, I know like uh, some folks who are Rilkean scholars really like Gepser's work, like uh, Daniel Polakoff, who's done a great biography on Geps on uh, Rilke um, in the image of Orpheus. Uh, he has a fantastic lecture on the structures of consciousness in Rilke. But this is, again, you know, um, looking back, uh, I don't know which poets are, are really tuning into Gepser's work in an explicit way. So, um, that's 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 a, an unfinished task we can explore. Um, I will say this: there is a great group. Uh, uh, I think I think they're called Cosmos Cafe. Marco Morelli started this great group with um, Heather Fester and a few other integralists that are exploring this poetry. And I know them in, in our in the context of being in their community. Um, so they're playing around with this in, in a Gibsonian way. Um, so I can give you that at least. Um, I, I would say. It, in the poetic and in the artistic, there is a lot to explore, but it's not explicitly tied to Gepser. But I would say the aperspectival themes are very present in, in contemporary media. Wonderful, thanks so much, Kate. Um, and maybe at some point, if you could drop the, I got the first part, Jeremy, the Cafe Cosmos, but not the name that you mentioned. So if you just drop that in the message, that would be great. Um, and then we'll go to Guy James, if you could unmute and ask your question, Guy. Thank you. Uh, hi, Jeremy. Um, so my, my question was, um, I admit I'm a little bit at my limit with Gebser. It's a little bit like when I read uh, Krishnamurti, that um, I kind of get a sense of what he's talking about, but somehow the words don't quite capture it. So um, the question is, could the sense of time run away from us, be embodied in our systems, such as in our, our language or in the financial system in the form of interest. Um, as, as in in the financial system, there's always more debt than money. So we have the sense of constantly running to be able to pay off the debt, but it's, it's impossible. We're never able to catch up. There, there's a sense uh, whereby the future 
our idea of the future is supposedly going to fulfill the present, which is somehow never enough. So would it be Gebs's opinion that we appear to be escaping into time somehow with the systems that we've created? Yeah, um, great question. I, I would definitely say that our contemporary or modern extractive economic system, uh, really the history of capitalism and industrialization is a wonderful expression I mean, wonderful, I mean, problematic, but really a good illustration of the mental perspectival's inability to master time, to have such a one directional relationship with time as extractive, as borrowing from the future in the present, right? Same thing as colonization. But then there's also this wonderful intensity that it gives us. There's an elation that it gives us, right? The innovation and the progress, et cetera, et cetera. So we've been on a kind of um, uh, uh, launch ramp for the past few hundred years that has been going exponentially faster. And a lot of other thinkers have commented on that. I'm thinking of like Walter Benjamin's like famous exegesis on Paul Klee's angel, the angel um, of history, as it were, that's trying to stop the winds blowing in from heaven to stop this catastrophe of history this, from occurring. That sense of runaway time um, for Gebser is to articulate it carefully, the perspectival world's inability to master the new consciousness, attempting to do it through the machinations of the mental world, right? Clock time, extractive time, segmented time colonizing, spatializing time. So our economics is, is completely in, in, in tandem with, you know, with this mental perspective of world. The interesting thing would be, you know, what are, obviously a lot of people are talking about this, what comes after capitalism? What's post-capitalist? I think that's the same question as a, what is integral consciousness? How do we get out of a one directional form of, of a spatialized time and spatialized consciousness that can only kind of extract and go in one way? Um, we're stuck in forward gear. Uh, and I use that example actually in my book, um, talking about, you know, kind of contemporary media. Uh, uh, I use the, the anime film Akira and the image of the cyberpunk motorcycle and this mega city as a good kind of myth theme of the perspectival age that's run amok, right? The, the intensity of the machine. Paul Virilio talks quite a bit about that with dromology, right? Like that uh, modernity uh, it, it is sort of in this sort of, it loves speed. And then also it kind of invents its opposite or its shadow, right? The crash. When you invent the motorcycle, you invent the motorcycle crash. Well, the perspectival age is very much like that. It can only go ahead. It doesn't see the wake of what it, what it has innovated, right? So yes, I would say that's a great example and illustration of perspectival consciousness that has then run into a crisis because it cannot master time. It's a bit like um, Douglas Roshkoff said, we're trying to invent a car that will go faster than its own exhaust. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> Rushkoff has a great book called Present Shock. Yeah, it's amazing. Which, yeah, you know, yeah. it sounds ironically not Gebserian, but it, he's very much talking about how digital culture is exhibiting this flat nowness, right? Everything has to happen all yesterday. That is, a f we can feel that if we're looking for a way to concretize time eruption as a precursor to integral, like, because integral isn't feeling that kind of dread and anxiety. Gebs are saying there's a, there's a relationship with time that is much more whole oriented and then actually can allow us to slow down and reverse and become present, right? There's a new relationship with time that the integral is asking us for. And as a sub, like this is an aside, but this last year in 2020, I think all of us have felt the sense of time eruption and been forced to slow down. You know, we're, we're really, I mean, that was such a fantastic illustration of so many of Gebser's um, principles. Yeah, awesome really? question, thanks. Yeah, that was wonderful. I love this time to space stuff. Oh, it makes me ding. <laughs> so next question from Rod Howell. If you could unmute yourself, that would be great. Sure, all right. I apologize, I'm a, I'm a literal thinker and and I'm sure he's much deeper in, on a higher level than I am, but as I was reading through it, um, when he says, um, he's quote, his overemphasis on the objectivity externa, a consequence of an excessively visual orientation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To me, I was like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe we're focusing on the objective world or, or as being as objective as we can because of the great power in the idea and the great results. Because we've always been visual creatures, but I would say we've not always been as objective as now. So 
and that may just be a nitpick, but like I said, I'm a very literal person. So as I was reading through that, that kind of hit me as like, I, is that, I don't know, maybe you can uh, expound on that. Yeah, I would say the, the, then there's no problem with, with uh, vision uh, and perspective. It's the overemphasis on it due to what you're saying, right? Like it's getting great results, right? You, you keep doing that. You keep measuring and observing and spatializing. You, you keep getting results. Gebs are simply saying like it, it's reached a zenith point right? Where we are now out of control, where, you know, nobody can talk to anybody anymore. And we're in this sort of um, communication crisis where everybody's tribalizing and fragmenting and segmenting. And he's saying, that's the other end of, of, of vision of the perspectival oriented culture. That's the other side of the practice is that when it's overemphasized, maybe this language can help. He says, you know, every structure of consciousness has an efficient expression and a deficient. And it's really when it reaches this sort of peak zenith of mastery, the creative mastery, that it begins to become more quantitative, more inflated, and more, um, I would say, not predominant exactly, but totalizing. And it's just, it's just our, our relationship with the perspectival thinking, which has become totalizing, that's the problem. So it needs a better relationship with the whole, with hearing and other senses. Um, one-sidedly, it's a problem. When it's in relation to the whole, then it, it has, that's a different story in a different context. And that's what he's really asking for or looking out for right now. It's like, how do we change our perception? And again, like it has to do with our senses. Like he, even as you're, you're describing, uh, the, the, the visual is, is, a, is a way of embodying ourselves in the world. Even abstraction is a way of embodying ourselves in our sense perceptions. Um, I don't know if that helps exactly, Rod, but or if that gets exactly it's to helpful. where you're going. At least gets the spirit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Lovely. Yeah. Capturing the spirit. And then we continue. <laughs> um, there's a question from Tracy. If you could unmute, that would be great. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Hi, Tracy. Hello. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm, I'm fairly new to this, by the way. So I'll point that out. Um, so I hadn't come across him. I did check you out on YouTube. Um, I read the text a couple of times, but that style of writing was quite difficult for me to get um, a clear. I didn't get any clarity, I think. Now, is that because I needed to have the context? But the question actually was, how did you get there? Because you must have had context to understand Gebser to that degree. So that's the end yeah. bit is probably the question, Jeremy. Good question. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier to Jules, right, about um, the the context where I got into Gebser was being very steeped in integral theory circa 2006, 2005. And, you know, really grokking what Wilbur was doing and the Integral Institute was doing and Integral Naked and that whole community and um, wanting to contextualize Wilbur because Wilbur cites so many people, so many thinkers. I wanted to hear them in their own words. So I started to read Tehard. I started to read Gepser. I started to read Aurobindo. Um, and I was in my young, you know, I was like early 20s. So it was very easy to just sort of dive intellectually while I was at college. And uh, that's the, what happened with Gebser was I knew immediately he was doing, he had that poetic sensibility in relationship to, to what he was talking about. And he was giving so many concrete, aesthetic, cultural examples of these structures in a way that really brought everything to life for me. At the same time, in my early 20s, I think he was really difficult and very dense, and I could only get like a little bit and stop and then continue. So it took a few years for me to really become more fluent with his style and comfortable with it um, to, to even begin to think about like writing a, a book like me 10 years ago, I would have no, no desire to do anything like that. Um, so it took some it took some warming up, I think, to his approach um, and style of writing. And uh, even then, I think there's a way in which it's what he does indirectly for you as a reader that's more important perhaps than what he offers directly at first, right? Like I was saying that the catalytic reading sometimes is, it, it, it restructures our thinking and our, and our 
perception um, in a way that is is only observable over time. Again, there's a different relationship with a book like that. It works on you over time. So those would be my, my initial observations. Like for me, it's some, something got me hooked. It was this new relationship with time. It was the way he was concretely expressing the structures of consciousness uh, through illustrations of art um, that really clicked, that really, really clicked for me and made me stay and made me try to work at the book. So I under, I, I've paid attention to Wilbur. Yeah. So I think the lesson for me is I probably need the whole book in order to be able to understand sections thereof. Yeah. Admittedly, yeah. you know, what I did was very like for, for necessity's sake, here's some little snippets, right? Yeah. No, no. And, yeah. I'm, not, I'm, I'm not complaining, Jeremy. I'm, it's just an observation that I need context. Oh, yeah. and, and, and that's great. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one more from Nolan. If Nolan could unmute himself, that would be great. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Is that okay. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, there seemed to be a small niggle between Wilbur and his renaming of the mental and how Ebsa described the mental. So the, the, where was rational and Epps's mental and the differences between them, if you could explain those a little bit, please. Yeah, you know, I, I love Wilbur as, as um, like I said, I, I was I was very interested in him. He was like my gateway to all of these other thinkers. Um, and I have a lot of friends and colleagues who are integral theorists and emphasize the developmental and meta theory and I like to swim in those waters too, but I think what Gebser is really pointing to is this unfinished work of, of, of uh, like, like Timothy Morton says, you know, the history of modernity has been anything you can do, I can do meta. To continue to go on that track seems to, you know, be besides the point, right? And, and this is really the kind of, the emperor has no clothes inside Gebser's offering. And, and I feel like Wilbur to some capacity is still um, uh, attempting the grand synthesis, attempting the theory of everything. Um, but I have a good essay that's in the back of the, at the bottom of the, the document on, uh, it's called Meta, comma, Modern, where I really kind of unpack that. Like, how do we really express the whole without necessarily doing through the conduit of, of, of the mental structure, right? Spatial, categorical theory of everything, big picture theory. Can we describe the whole in any other way? Can our thinking and can theory and even can the mental structure innovate a new statement, a new form of thinking? Where is, who's doing that? And I see Wilbur is kind of holding that bridge. He's kind of, he's talking about holes and totalities and process and emergence, but it's still in a very systemic developmental oriented way. I think Gebser is really kind of pointing to to a new a new approach that hasn't really been experimented with um, in that kind of comfortable sense of really gaining ground and, and exploring and uh, mastering. Um, so I'm interested in that. When it comes to that, is the context for the answer to the question about the little issue about Wilbur renaming the structure. Um, there's so much context behind the mental. Uh, for instance, when Gebser is talking about the emergence of the mental, he goes to myth. He, he relates back to myth and the etymology of the word menace. And he goes to the roots of the word being this kind of ambiguous masculine feminine. And then going into the roots of the word talking about wrathfulness, directed purpose of action and activity, relating it to um, you know some of the Greek myths that are very kind of um, when he says the mental consciousness is very directive oriented, it's going forth on the battlefield, it's going forth to conquer space. Um, it's the is the furrowed brow that bears the burden of suffering and self awareness. So there's so much that goes into the context of the word itself that to drop it and to call it rational, which Gebser uses to describe the deficient mode of the mental. He says we move into the mental ratio where everything becomes. Um, we're dividing, the dividing deed leads to death, as he says, you know, when that becomes the overemphasis, then we're in trouble with the, uh, with the deficient mental structure. So to just replace it with that and not adding it of that context, I think is a little problematic. And then he also adds pluralistic, 
Um, and he has some commentary on Gebser not getting postmodernism because he died right before that era began. But really, you know, if you, a deep reading of Gebser doesn't need to be revisioned necessarily to add in any additional structures. Like the mental structure is something that is, um, and any of the structures, they're all co-present and they're deep, almost strata of our being um, to, to tack on a few extra bits, you know, it seems to be superficial, right? Um, and again, too sequential, developmental oriented, really not seeing. So I, I think I think he's a little incorrect in his reading of Gepser here and there. That's all. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so we're going to go to um, the after hours now. Rod, you had a last question, but it, I think it's a complex one. So maybe if you've got a bit of time to just hang on in the after hours, maybe either Jeremy or, or, or some of the other Gebserites uh, can unpack it. But Jeremy, I just wanted to would say thank you. And, and can you tell us, you've been so generous and really, you know, unpacking Gebser for us uh, this evening. Uh, what, could you tell us what you're working on now, what your plans are? I heard you, you're thinking about maybe doing something about integral futurism or where can people um, find more of your work as well? Sure. Thanks, Jules. And and thanks, everybody at Rebel Wisdom, David, Ella. This has been a great session, and I love I loved everyone's questions. Um, and I'll definitely stick around for the, the after discussion party for a bit. Um, yeah, you can go to, you can find me on Twitter. It's JDJ underscore rights. Um, or you can find me at mutations.blog. And I have a Patreon link there, and I do a lot of uh, a lot of weekly sessions with uh, my Patreon community. We're not just reading Gebser; we go through a lot of different thinkers. We have um, an ongoing book club series. Um, as we call it the Pop Up Integral Study Salon every Wednesday, so we do that too. Um, but yes, to, to the question about the book, I am currently working on my second book, tentatively just called Fragments of an Integral Futurism, um, and that book is really taking what I've started at the end of my first book on Gebser, which was like, okay, what are some contemporary examples I can offer? Um, and really knowing like the first book was a primer on EPO and Gebser's work, but what I would really like to do is to take Gebser's approach, this integral phenomenology, cultural philosophy, we haven't really unpacked that, but these are his methodologies, and just to continue to apply them in the present. I think there's so much to talk about with what's going on right now. Um, so that's what it is. It's sort of reclaiming a sense of time and temporics from this integral perspective. And it's looking, it's kind of, it's kind of ambitious, but it's looking at our at deep history um, with like some of the contemporary research and anthropology about our past. Um, and then also looking into the future in the sense of reclaiming the sense of the future. So, yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you. I'm going to hand over to Ella to, um, to chair the after hours. Um, thank you very much, Jeremy. Everybody, the next book, uh, I think it's on May the 3rd, tell me if I'm wrong, Monday, the first Monday of the month, and we'll be doing Alan Watts's The Book or The Taboo Against Knowing Who You Are. So if you feel like reading that, uh, uh, and Tim Lott will be joining us and talking about that. Um, so thanks again, Jeremy, and uh, over to you, Ella. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. That was really deep. I feel like quite in a slight strength, kind of a still but heady space. So we're going to transition with a tune to the after hours. Um, by a break, I'll put some music on when I share screen and then yeah, stick around if you wish. And it'd be lovely for you to stay on as well, Jeremy, if you have a little bit of time. The film you just watched was a conversation that happened in Rebel Wisdom's digital campfire. So to join conversations like this, to submit questions, stay for the after hours hangout to talk about the ideas in the films and to practice and develop some of the skills we talk about on the channel check out the membership options there's three different levels of membership sense makers get to join our regular sense maker showcase events with some of the most interesting thinkers around and also the monthly wisdom gym sessions where we speak to and also have a chance to work with some of the world's best teachers and facilitators Explorers can join the Rebel Wisdom Book Club sessions, the monthly philosophical journey sessions, and also the regular Skills Academy to practice skills like mindfulness, sovereignty, and sense-making. Also, Rebel Wisdom will be at the Inner State Festival in Albania in September, so check out the link below for details. And from now on, all members get to join our monthly AMA sessions with us, where you can ask any questions about anything to do with Rebel Wisdom.